were in our studio and thought it might make sense to kind of talk to you about why we have a studio, why we have, why we spend money on production at our church. Mm -hmm. So over 150,000 people watch our streams each week. Whoa. <laughs> but our seat, auditorium seats 600, right? So the math doesn't add up. <laughs> Where are those people watching from? Are Pris they prisons. Prison. Oh wow, that's fascinating. So um, we, I mean, we do have you know a few hundred people that watch our stream online that aren't in prisons, but um, our church has made a big deal of reaching inmates and reaching people who who people don't usually reach. Like we have some campuses that we're doing in elderly facilities, um, but we also have campuses at prisons, and we have our church physically goes in and reaches out to, to inmates. So we're not just streaming to them, we actually care about them and want them to know like they are valued. And so we care a lot about our live stream because a lot of people watch it. Um, whether it's people who attend the church, who are at home missing out on a weekend, whether it's someone who's in a correctional facility, someone who's in a nursing home, whoever's watching our live stream, we want them to have a good experience um, because it shows that we value them. Um, and ultimately, hopefully the experience points them to Jesus. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Worship Tech Tour. We are here at Life Fellowship Church in Dallas, Texas. I'm excited to have Cody Patterson, the tech director at this church, also the cameraman right now, walk you through the setup that they have here. And I'm especially excited to show you their Red Komodo 4K live streaming setup. So if you are considering taking your church to that next level with your live stream to have that cinematic quality uh, in 4K with some really nice lenses and with some amazing follow camera setups that are easy to train a volunteer within five minutes, this is the video you're gonna watch. We'll put the chapter markers on the video here on YouTube so you can conveniently scrub through to the appropriate location. But not only are you gonna learn about a really great video and live streaming setup, we're gonna talk about just controlling all of your audio and video outputs and destinations throughout the whole church building. They have a really great integration solution here at the church using Qsys and Crestron. You're not gonna wanna miss that. There's so much more we cover in this video, but you'll see it for yourself. Let's go ahead and dive in. This is the auditorium. So you'll notice that we have dark walls as per usual in the modern church. One thing that is unique about our ceiling is the acoustic panels. They're half wood and the half some other composite that material that absorbs sound. Um, and so it just creates a nice look and design while also being functional. We actually have some spots inlaid in the walls, which are kind of perfect if you ever want to do cameras in here because we can put a camera up against the wall. It's not going into the chairs and taking up space. This is front of house. We start here with audio council. We have an Adeline Heath D Live. Um, we're also running Waves sound grid. Um, with an extreme server and um, we have a computer here that the person who's running audio can use as just a way to monitor other things that are happening in service. It could be a backup. We have a backup pro presenter computer here for um, recording or live streaming. So if it's the middle of the week and we don't want to start up Resi and do some large event just to record something on stage, we could just record here if we wanted to. We have a monitor. The person running in front of house can hear the band MD. So if something's happening on stage, we can monitor what's happening because they, they talk to us and we can communicate back and forth. We just added a drum MD too, so the drummer can talk with us. So walking down a little further, um, we actually, you'll see this Terra Deck. I know this is more video related, but I wanted to get one of our wireless handheld cams, um, the transmitter and the receivers kind of closer to each other. And so one of our cams that's usually in the back of the room has this one closer to them. The, when I got here, this was just one straight piece and the camera operators had to essentially climb up onto the stand and it was a tripping hazard and everything. And so we cut into it and pushed it out and I got some comfier seats and put stairs in here so that when people are going up and down to the cameras, they can actually go up and down to them without falling, uh, which is you know important. Over here we have uh, our ProPresenter computer. And so this is running all of our screens um, we recently put the LED wall into one solid piece before it was split up in multiple pieces. Um, and ProPresenter ran that as well, but we have our two side screens, our LED wall, and then ProPresenter operating them. So okay. backgrounds, content, lyrics, 
anything we want to show up on screens besides a camera runs through ProPresenter. Running an LED wall is kind of interesting. And so in Screen Config for ProPresenter, um, you're, you're typically you're going to run an SDI cable to an LED screen. And SDI is a 16 by 9 signal. And so even though you may not have a 16 by 9 wall, um, you're able to, in ProPresenter, actually choose a target window. And you could say, we're not running a 4K wall, so we're just going to target you know, 1920 by 720 or something. Mm. So for example, our Lyric Strip. We have a Lyric Strip above our LED wall, and that's an LED wall itself. But it's only 1536 pixels wide and 144 pixels tall. So even though it's running down the 16 by 9 signal path, you have to say, hey, this is the size of the wall specifically. And then it goes out and you can see in this small little square here, it's 16 by 9 with a little bit of lyric strip showing. Because, oh, wow. Yeah, just inside that itself. Because that's actually what it's ProPresenter is pushing out to. So then we, we have lots of screens in here. Um, our main side screens, our main LED wall, the lyric strip. Um, this is just a backup screen we can use if we want to send extra content to our lobby or something separately. Mm. Our stage display in the back of the room. Um, this operator view is actually this screen. Uh, screen over here, so they can see data and information about what's happening oh, from nice. back here. Yeah. Um, depending on what's showing, this is what's happening on our side screens, this is what's happening on our LED wall, and this is what's happening on the confidence monitor behind us. Because I don't want to always be turning around and looking at the confidence monitor mm -hmm. to check it. Mm -hmm. And then we got timers and basic data on the side for the service. Because a lot of times this is where the producer will stand and they'll talk through the service on comms and be like, hey, worship, worship starting in three, two, one, or Take, take the intro video or whatever. And so it's nice to have that data in front of them. And then the other screens, uh, we just had one more. Um, and this is just an NDI feed that we send to around the campus in case we want to see it on our computer. We are witnessing Mr. ProPresenter himself and how he runs ProPresenter at his church. So this is a uh, historic video, folks, for the channel here. I run ProPresenter at the max. So we, we, I mean, you saw there was lots of screens configured in there. Some of them were 4K. And this is just an M1 Pro Mac Mini. Wow. And you never have weird glitches or restarts? Never, rarely. Rarely. Oh, <laughs> never. You never say never. Uh, I've never had an issue during service while I've been here. Correct. Most of my ProPresenter headaches, as much as I give ProPresenter a hard time, most of the headaches fortunately come when I'm prepping for service. Yeah. And again, I don't know if it's just the way the application works when you're like creating documents, changing settings, that's when you're most likely to upset it and it needs, it freezes and you have to restart it, but. Yeah, there's just so, like when you're creating a service and you're putting slides in and you're editing things and you're going back and forth between things, there's so much more potential for a weird combination of features being touched than yeah. ProPresenter didn't like or the computer didn't like, yeah. causing an issue. But during service, I mean, you're doing the thing that most churches are doing consistently. And so that's the thing that's obviously tested the most and, and perfected the most. And so, I mean, I rarely, if ever, have an issue during service. So inside of ProPresenter, we're receiving MIDI cues for triggering our slides from Ableton. And then we're also sending MIDI cues to light key for lighting. And so throughout our service, um, we'll, while we're not triggering lighting cues for every like lighting scene for a song, we are triggering them for transition moments in our service. So going into the message, ProPresenter triggers our lighting changes throughout our room. Um, going into the start of a song, ProPresenter is going to trigger a lighting cue change. Countdown videos, it's going to take your lighting down. Those, that's the sort of thing that ProPresenter is doing. And so um, we actually have a lot of macros built out. And I mean, it's one large list of macros here that there's some that you can see that are labeled lighting and they tell you what they do. So I could click on them right now and it would change it. Or, um, for example, macros we have for lower thirds to bring up people's names. So there's a lot of things that you can use macros for and we definitely use them to the max. Yeah, show me what's your guys' usual workflow in light key. Okay. So obviously you have your designer where you can select a light and do what you want with it. But we tend to operate with presets. On the right side here, you have lots and lots and lots of presets. So we have fixtures. Inside the fixture, we have like a dimmer level, um, some generic effects that we build to do specific things. Like for example, this effect is just turning on and off a few of the, the jolts one at a time. Um, and then we have colors. And so basically what we do is we create fixtures, fixture presets for every fixture we have, and then we combine them into a queue. 
And that's how we create our worship scenes. And throughout our songs, we're changing them seven to 17 times per song. We're, we're constantly moving lights, we're using blinders, we're doing whatever to create a scene that we want to look, create. And uh, so we have cue lists, and that's where we run our cues from. So our normal weekend cue list it doesn't have any songs in it because we actually take the songs and put them in an archive, then we'll just drag them in. So this is our song archive that has all the songs we currently have in there. And so we can just drag the cues that we have made for Here in Your Presence into the list for this week. And then outside of our cue list, we also have pre-made just buttons that an operator could click as needed. So if something goes wrong, we could jump to the message lighting. It'll switch to the message lighting. Um, but we also use these as the buttons that Pro Presenter triggers throughout the service outside of worship. So our cue list is for worship, and then our standard buttons are typically for the transition moments during the service. That's a really good use of a cue list. I never actually, I tend to just stay on the whole, the button mode, like for a lot of my cues, but that makes a lot of sense. Especially yeah. if you have a lot of songs with different cues throughout the songs. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that was a big deal was, I mean, sometimes we have, a, not a lot of these are gonna show, but sometimes we'll have, you know, 10 cues in a song. Mm -hmm. And to do a good job of controlling the fade pretty fast, how, how you want to have the fades go. Oh, um, yeah. Be, be able to jump in and out of them. I, th I think it's convenient to just build it like this. And then instead of having to remake my buttons all the time or move them in and out, because um, buttons tend to take up a lot of space. And so what we do is, these are things an operator can do on the fly, mm -hmm. um, even some effects for our lighting. Mm -hmm. So if randomly we wanted to end, let's see what this one does. This one just ends with like at yeah. the end of the song, people are clapping. We can turn that on really quick. Yep. We can turn it off and then it, it fades off. Well, I didn't turn it off. Then it fades off. Oh yeah, nice. So there are some things an operator can do on the fly, and there's some things that we program in Ableton controls. Okay, all right, walk us through your lighting fixtures. All right, so first I'll start with my favorite, which is the jolts. Whoa. They can blind you. Mm -hmm. So that's, I mean, that's, we use them as an always on light sometimes, and then sometimes we just use them as a blinding effect and have them pop up for a second. And you can obviously change the colors and do whatever. Which manufacturer is that? This is ADJ. Oh, cool. And they're really cheap. Um, there are some other manufacturers and brands that make other ones that are more known. Mm -hmm. And we just chose this because we could buy multiple of them for a good price, where if we went with a, you know, a, a different manufacturer, we could maybe get three. Yep. So yep. Uh, we chose this one. For us, we, we really focus on not using colored lights. Mm. Um, to us, we really like the look of just a, a cool white or an orange white. Mm. And rarely throwing in a color here or there, yeah. um, but we don't usually do that color that color with our, our jolts. Usually, it'll be with the moving light or something. So those are the jolts, uh, and then we have moving lights. Let's turn on some for you. So here's some of our moving lights. We have some on the floor, and we we tend to point them at the ceiling, and we'll have them sometimes with effects. We'll have them pan the ceiling. Mm -hmm. So those three are beams. They're Chave beams. I think they're the RX2 or something like that. And then we have two spotlights up next to those. And these can um, zoom in more than the beams can. So sometimes we'll use it as just a cool effect um, when we want to point at a specific person because they, they have a, a, just the ability to zoom in in a tighter zoom. Right now, I obviously don't have them zoomed in a ton, but. So those are the five that we have across the ceiling. Then we have those two on the ground, and then we have four um, R2 washes from Chave. And those are typically used to wash our crowd. So let me move those out like that. Nice. So sometimes we'll have them in on the vocalists. We might point them towards the middle vocals. Um, and just, just kind of own in on that kind of uh, raw environment on stage. And then sometimes when it's a bigger moment in the song, we'll push them out on the crowd, it, which is also nice for lighting for cameras because then our crowd is more lit up for shots of the crowd. Last light that we have that's physically on stage is our battens. And so that's right below the LED wall. We can change the color on that. And we can change the brightness. And that's about all that one does. Sometimes we'll, we'll put an effect on it to kind of dim in and out just to create an effect behind the vocals. 
Nice. And then our front lights or key lights are just static lights. Um, they're not they're not movable. I have two two rows of them. Um, they're primarily aimed at the front half of the stage. So there's not really necessarily a band light that lights up our band. But when our lights on stage are bright, they're lighting up the band because there's just so much light happening. But the key lights are set to right now to about a 4100 Kelvin. Um, I would love to be like 4700 or 5100 um, so we could get more of like a, a cool white look. But these lights without putting a filter in front of them, you really can't do that. And with the filter in front of them, it makes them darker just because they're not naturally meant for that, that color. We do have some moving lights across the top near our key lights. So mm -hmm. if you point up near the projector area. Yep. We have three moving lights there that you can see. There's one that's a spotlight in the middle. So we'll use that as a dramatic effect during like a Christmas service or something where we want to point at a specific person for a minute. Maybe it's a monologue. Mm. And they have two wash lights next to those that we can put wherever we want on the stage. Here's a chorus, a down, like a, a mid-tone chorus from Alleluia. And then bridge with just some moving lights just shining down. Uh, let me turn down the house lights just to give you a little bit more of what's actually happening. Big chorus at the end of the song. You can see the RTs pointed out at the crowd to watch the crowd. And then ending. And so the top jolts are left on, the R2s are left on, but everything dimmed down a little bit. It's almost like a rose gold color. Yeah. The, especially the jolts and stuff. I like yeah. that. Or a, I guess a warmer white, but it almost has some of that uh, little bit of reddish uh, hue to it as well. Oh, I see you guys got the uh, stream decks back here. Yeah. So this one is primarily used for lighting. Mm -hmm. So you can turn on and off the haze machine, go to a specific lighting preset. Um, this, this is actually like we use these when we're running lights live because sometimes we won't do the lights in automated mode and we'll actually run the lights live and so we'll have like, you can click movers and buttons and it does something specific. Oh yeah. So that's just like a quick way to, to do that. And then over here we've got one for... This one's my favorite one. ProPresenter macros. Of course it's my favorite because it's ProPresenter related. Yep. So yeah, we can do lower thirds on this one. I can turn on and off MIDI from our Ableton computer. Oh, so yeah. when they are going off book and spontaneous, we're not triggering the wrong slides. Mm -hmm. So I can click this and it mutes the track on Ableton up at, on stage. Nice. And then uh, I can clear props, clear background media or slides. I can start the Resi, because we live stream through the Resi. And so I can actually, for this, this is our decoder. So when we're doing a video recorded sermon, let's say the pastor isn't going to preach live and we're going to preach, we're going to have a video preaching message. We'll bring down our center screen here in person and I'll click start here and it actually starts Resi playback. So basically we're just playing content out of Resi to our screens at that point. Because ahead of time, someone put like a cue mark within Resi on that video of where it needs to start. Yeah, so you can see over here, this is our Resi decoder and how you can access it. And we created cues, start bumper at this time of the, the video, start message at this time, and end message. So if I click go to here, now it's ready to, to cue whenever I click play. But I actually click play over here on the stream deck because I'm not usually over on that computer. Got it. So clicking that, we'll start that. And then there's a pause for the decoder. And in the back of our auditorium, we have a video room where we have hyperdecks that we can record all of our content to. So we record a, uh, a program feed of our content. We, we record a program without graphics. So if we want to post on social media without a lower third popping up, we can do that. And I actually have a button that starts the recording on all of our hyperdecks from here at once in the back. And then all right, I, I get annoyed when I see timers running. And so I created the reset timer buttons. It's like a turn off oh, timer. Oh, nice. Nice screen. and clean. Yeah. So that's a little bit about what that stream deck does. While everything is automated, for the most part, um, someone might walk out on stage that we weren't planning. And so we actually have a MIDI controller here to control light like, keys, faders. So if I turn up this, it's going to turn up our front key lights. You can see right here it does that. So as, as I'm moving things down on the controller here, it's doing it up there. Nice. So these are our house lights. Our, I'm going to turn up house lights again so you have light. Yeah, I have lights. <laughs> Sorry about that. Nice. Um, so we have house lights again. And then our front and back key lights. We have a light that hits the front of the stage floor. So if someone's going to come out and talk in front of the stage instead of on stage, we can mm -hmm. light them up. We have a light for our piano player if they come out and 
they're going to play something, and we don't want them just in the dark com completely. We'll do that. Uh, our center spotlight, which is the key, key light that's out here, and then our other spotlights that are wash lights kind of out here. Very nice. That's What model is that controller? The Studio Logic what? Mixed face. Mixed face. Nice. So this guy is kind of related to lighting. That's why it's over here. Um, this is an ability for someone to walk in the room during the week, and um, if they need preaching lights on stage, they could click preaching lights, and it does. Uh, it has scenes saved into here that we put on light key. Mm. So once we make the light key scene, we just hold the button for a little bit. It saves it as a scene that we can then click, and then it makes that live. So that's helpful if we're going to have someone use the auditorium, and I'm not available. One of our techs isn't available. They can come in and they can click one of these scenes. We have pre-service preaching, some worship options off. And I think one of the coolest buttons on here is this button, because what this does is it locks the lighting controls in our room so that if someone walks in the room on a Sunday morning, they're not just messing up the lighting controls that are next to our doors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But during the week, if we have it off, people can turn on and off the house lights as they need to work in the room or they want to come in and pray or whatever. It's similar to the uh, Pro Church Lights has a wall panel they make. Sim yeah. Similar functionality. You can have multiple ones, save scenes. You can lock people out. Um, yeah, very great solution. So we're in our church lobby, and what I love about this setup is um, people are able to actually come out in our lobby if they have access to this panel here, and they can turn on and off music that's playing in the lobby. They can turn on and off all of our TVs that are in the lobby. So we have the ability to displays on, displays off. Um, you can specifically control, like, these are the second floor. So I want to turn off this, this hallway TV in the second floor, or, or I want to change what content is showing on that TV. So you can be very, very specific here, but I love just the, back, the fact that we can come in here and we can do power on, power off. I want everything to show the worship center, or I want everything to be on signage. And signage for us is just an Apple TV running playlister. And then audio, we can mute and unmute audio, change the volume, and choose a music source. So we actually have like a, a Spotify, I don't know if I should say that legally. <laughs> we, <laughs> we have a Spotify running um, just 24-7, yep. and that's our global house music. Nice. And worship center is a music source, is when anything at front of house. Hmm. And then kids house music is another Spotify just option for, for kids music. So explain to folks who are new to Crestron and this whole system of connecting all the um, I.O. throughout the building to all the different devices, like how does that work? Is there like a central brain somewhere where you're piping in all of that audio and video, and then do all the TVs have like a receiver? That's that's what I would think of how it works. But what's yeah, going on? I think I think it is important to understand first that the majority of the time you're running an SDI cable or HDMI cable throughout your building to get to your TVs. With Crestron, it's ran through your Ethernet, and so you run Ethernet to all of your devices, and then you have a Crestron decoder or encoder and that's going to send signal or receive signal. And so we have a, a Crestron encoder in our server room, which is encoding our video feed from our video switcher. And so that's then sending it into Crestron. Crestron is then decoding it at each of the TVs. And part of the benefit of that is that we can at any point send any content we want to a specific TV. So instead of running an SDI cable to each TV and it being on a splitter or something where it's all coming from the same, con the same source, we're actually able to say, I want this TV to be this content, this TV to be different content, that TV to be different content, because inside of Crestron, we can have multiple sources. So we have multiple encoders going into Crestron, so we can have multiple sources. So for example, we have an Apple TV that we use for signage. It uses the app Playlister, which a lot of kids' ministries will use. Um, and then we have our worship center content coming out into the lobby, and that's one of the sources that's in Crestron. And um, we also have just the local inputs on the Crestron devices, just like you would have on your TV. And so someone might go and plug an Xbox into the TV for youth group. And on our wall panels that we showed you, those wall panels can then say, oh, I want to use the local input source instead of the worship center source. And so you can choose and mix and match what source you want to use at the TV. But that's really cool because then let's say that we add on to our facility I don't need to run an SDI cable all the way back to the original destination or source in our video room. I can just add an Ethernet to our switch that we ran. And all, that's all I'm doing is adding that to the TV. So I no longer need to run these huge long runs everywhere. I'm just going to that local switch that I added in and getting crush run data from that. Now, QSIS, 
QSYS is uh, primarily used here to manage our audio distribution and um, just the, the managing of that, I guess. So we'll have a QSYS, um, we have QSYS hardware in our video server room, and that's what gets audio into QSYS, and then QSYS manages it for us. So we can say, hey, we want it to go to our lobby TVs, or I want, I want my front of house audio to go into our growth track room, or I actually want to play our kids' Spotify playlist in growth track room. And so in each of our rooms, we have a panel from Crestron that controls Crestron devices as well as QSYS data. And so I can say I want a different music source just like I want a different video source. And you can mix and match them on the panel. That's good to know. So QSYS and Crestron are very compatible. They're very compatible. Um, they're really, they do different things, but they also do some of the same things. So it just kind of depends how you want to run them. QSYS is, or QSYS is primarily, though, audio and Crestron is video and management of which sources and destinations you want to be used together. This is one of our rolling front of house carts. We have two, and um, we actually use them quite a bit now that we've made them, and they have good purpose. So we can take it around the whole building, move it around. Uh, it has some wireless microphones in it. So on the fly, we can go out in the lobby, we can go outside, and we can actually plug it in, and we'll show you hopefully those wall plates, but um, we can actually plug in this whole unit from its ports here on the side, and then we can start sending audio to a place in the lobby or outside. Because of Crestron and QSYS, we're able to plug into the wall panels, select that wall panel as our audio source for the lobby, or our audio source for our outside speakers, and then use this. So that's really cool when we do baptisms, because we'll just roll it outside, We'll give this to whoever's hosting the baptisms to talk on a microphone, we'll run Spotify or whatever music we want through it, and then um, basically have control over their audio from a mini front of house portable setup that we run outside. These are some wall ports you can plug into. You got two XLRs. So coming out of that front of house portable cart, you just plug in here, and then we can select that as an audio source on that, that Crestron panel in the lobby. And then while you're talking out here into that soundboard, your audio would be in the lobby. You know, we might have an event going on in front of these TVs over here, and we want to talk in the lobby, but we don't want to bring out portable speakers. We can just use the speakers that are built into our ceiling, and it's really convenient. We don't have to have people running around, plugging in a ton of stuff. You just bring out the cart and start going. Man, are those subs up there? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> this room is so cozy to me. We've got like the orange mood lighting and everything. Um, so this is our producer's desk. It's not really something that we have to use on a Sunday morning, but we could. Like, producer could sit here and call shots. And um, we, we actually have a backup of Pro Presenter back here, too. Pro Presenter everywhere. <laughs> this Why, wait, Why would you need a backup of Pro Presenter if it never fails? You should have a backup of everything. Okay. Even okay. if it doesn't fail. Okay, Mr. Pro Presenter. <laughs> this actually... Um, has 4K going into it, and so we could stream from ProPresenter in 4K if we want to back here. Mm. So if Resi failed, because we're not, we stream in 4K with Resi, if Resi failed, we can then stream out of ProPresenter, because ProPresenter can stream in 4K. Mm. And so we have video coming in here, um, but we also have video going out of here to our video switcher. So if for some reason front of house, let's say front of house lost power, and we still wanted to have our screens, well, we could throw up a graphic really quickly back here. Mm -hmm. Nice. And then we also use this computer just for editing and uh, making sure our videos are posted to YouTube each week. Now here's another um, Crestron, just what we saw on the panel in the lobby. This is quick access to it on a computer. So all the same settings that I could access on that panel out there, I could do from here. So if our executive pastor comes in and says, hey, the music isn't working in the lobby, from here, someone could be like, oh, it's because it's muted, and they could unmute it. Nice. This is where we switch our video. Video world. Yeah. So we, I'll, I'll just start with the, the boring part. We have a computer for mm -hmm. our video director. So in case they need to pull up something, they want to look at the live stream, see how it looks there. They could look at it there. Um, we brought in these lights because sometimes we like to capture video of ourselves while we're video directing for the fun of it. Um, but the TV on the back is our multi-view. We just have the one TV for right now, um, as well as this extra little screen and just gives us all the data we want to see. We can control what shows on the multi-view. 
uh, in the Blackmagic software. And then obviously we switch from here. So from our switcher, we have four different MEs. In, in the video world, that's basically like a, it's kind of like an output from a board. Mm -hmm. And instead of just having your left and right output on your board, you have left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. Yeah. And so that's, that's what we have back here is four. Nice. So this is one ME, and this is for controlling one output. This is for controlling one output. And then we can switch to a different ME, and now this is controlling a different output. Nice. And so we have our main program output, what's going to our side screens in our room. We have a live stream output. So if we want to switch content separately for our live stream, let's say it's the middle of the message and we don't want to switch content switch cameras on our side screens, but on our live stream, we may want to switch to a different camera. Um, maybe we want a wide shot of the LED screen because there's content on it that people can see in person, but online they couldn't see. But on our side screens, we don't necessarily want to show the wide shot because they already see it on the LED screen. So that's why we would go to the live stream output, switch cameras, switch back. And then we have our center screen output because during the 10.30 service at our church, we actually have a video fed message. Our pastor doesn't preach live at 10.30. And part of that is because we're going to a campus model, we have campuses, and those are video fed. And so we, we like to have our 10.30 service kind of be like a, a teaching moment that, hey, this is how it kind of works at our other campuses. And also it works well because 10.30 tends to be one of the more popular services for churches. And so it tends to push some of the people out to our other services to even out our service numbers, which is pretty cool. So we have a center screen that comes down. It's a head-to-toe shot of our pastor, and we can control what's showing on that center screen from one of our MEs. So there's a lot of control you can do by having multiple outputs, which I love. This app and iPad here is really cool. We can actually control and see what's happening on our red Komodos that are at front of house. So we can come in here and we could change the ISO or the color temperature. So the video director has complete control over all that without needing ScarHoy or some other external um, third-party control device. We could just do it from the iPad. Basically having like a shader in an app. Yeah, it's a shader in an app. That's awesome. And it's convenient because if you have multiple Komodos, you can see multiple of them with multiple previews all at one time. Pretty stable app too. Yeah, works, works, well. works great. We have it plugged into Ethernet because if you want a live preview mm -hmm. and you do it over Wi-Fi, it's not great. But Got it. You, can also, you also don't have to have a live preview. If you have a multi-view like, like we do right here, you could just look at that for your, yep. your visuals. And we chose the Holland comms uh, because they are at a good price point for a church um, while also being stable and um, we can actually hear things really well with them. We tried using some cheaper comms that are just headset only, didn't have a pack or anything. Um, they weren't able to get loud enough. Mm. Um, so we went with the, the Holland comms that has a pack. Yep, the, those and are the M1s? The M1s, yeah. yeah. And we can go throughout our whole building and not lose any signal. So I mean, we've got this room back here, auditorium, lobby, you go further up a second, uh, up a set of stairs, back to our studio, you still got signal, so. Yeah, the video director might get radiation poisoning, but you know. <laughs> Those things are massive. As long as everybody can hear us clearly, we're good. <laughs> so for us, this is really just a backup, the ClearCom unit. We don't okay. use it unless we need to. Yeah. Or we only have eight of these wireless comms. So we did a live recording a month or two ago for our worship team. We're coming out with an album. And um, we had, I think, like 10 or 11 people on production that needed to be on comms that week. Uh -huh. So at front of house, I used some wired comms and everyone else was on wireless. We use Hyperdex to record some backups and ISO recordings. This specific one doesn't show it right now because the camera's off, but this is our drum camera. A lot of our drummers like to post drum footage on social media. <laughs> so we went out of our way to create a, a dumb drum ISO for them. A and dumb, dumb, <laughs> dumb drum ISO. I, I heard it. I heard it. <laughs> and then uh, we have a clean program. So it's our 4K program of our board, the clean version, meaning no graphics. That's for our social media content. A camera to ISO only recording. That's our head to toe shot. So if we want to post footage of our pastor preaching, and on social media, it's going to crop in a waist up shot. This head to toe shot's better for social media because we can crop in and it's not cutting off you know, his face or whatever. And then at the bottom is just another redundant um, program I, recording, but this one's not clean. This one has our lower thirds and graphics on it. Nice. Coming over here, we have a um, Alta Studio that we use to bring in content to ProPresenter. This is the, the 4K one, so we can get 4K content into ProPresenter. And then we use 
two resi encoders. So you might wonder why we have two, and it's because, because of the fact that we do video fed sermons, um, we need to record a head to toe and waist up shot for our message. And so one of our encoders records that and also uses the waist up shot, which is our program shot, for our Facebook live stream and our website and app live stream. But on YouTube, we stream in 4K. And so we got a whole other encoder that has 4K going into it and is specifically just for 4K. So one of them's for recording our waist up shot, our head to toe shot, all in one. And the other one is just for YouTube streaming in 4K. To have 4K street live stream, you've got the 4K capable cameras. They're actually 6K cameras, right? And then the video switcher, um, actually even before you get to the video switcher, is that when you have to have 12G SCI cable to keep it 4K? Getting so actually, I, it depends how large your building is. Okay. For us, be, being that you know, we have a 600 seat auditorium and we're maybe 100 feet to front of house from here, we actually have some 3G cable ran there and the 4K signal works fine. Oh. The only thing that throws that off is if you have converters or adapters or wall plates, or maybe you have a rack room that has um, patch bays in it, if those patch bays or those wall plates have 3G converters on them, that tends to degrade the signal really fast. Mm. The signal can go 100, 150 feet, maybe 200 feet over the 3G cable just fine, okay. at least from my testing. But we have started running 4K cable as our new cable. In, and replacing some of the old ones as we go, just in case. But it's been working good, so what we've had to replace when we did our upgrade to 4K was we replaced our switcher, which was 1080i only, which is basically 720p, it's not 1080p. Um, we had to get a new encoder, we had to do one that was 4K capable, and we couldn't do the head to toe waist up shot and do 4K at the same time. We knew that we wanted to record our content in 4K, we didn't want to just record our old content, so we had to get new record decks we are still projecting in 1080p currently. We're just streaming in 4K. So we didn't change out our projectors or anything like that. Um, but we did have to change out our video hub, our router for our video content to 4K as well, because that was also 1080p before. Mm -hmm. And the cameras, we changed out. But the cabling was just minimal here and there. Speaking of the switcher and router, was that in here? Yeah. So something. I know a lot of times you think that that panel that, that we just saw was the switcher, but that was just a panel for controlling a switcher. And our actual physical switcher is right here. So this is the 4K Constellation 4ME. And then this is the video hub that routes all of our content throughout our building. And the, it's the 40 by 40 4K as well. And then above that, we have just some converters and ways to go back to 1080p because since we're sending 1080p to the projectors we don't have a way to get 1080p out of these uh, switchers and video hubs so we actually have to convert down to 1080p to go to the projectors yeah and then we have ethernet um, switches and ways to send internet throughout our building and so we actually have like at front of house we have a network cables there and let's say something is plugged into front of house network one we don't necessarily have to send the internet there. We could send Dante there. We could send video network there. This is all based on what we want to plug in here. So this, oh, cool. this cable is running all the way to front of house. And then here, we choose what we want to send to yep. that cable at the other end. Yeah. Here's your QSIS brain here. Yes, QSIS brain. All right, so you've got your, your DLive stage Yeah, so this is the, the mix rack. Mix rack. So okay. the DLive, this is the actual switcher. What, oh, you, what yeah, you see yeah. at front of house is not the switcher, it's just a controller, just like for the, the video switcher. Yep, that makes sense. So this is actually the physical con uh, console. Yep. And then we have a, basically an Ethernet cable just running to front of house, and then it controls it from the controller out there. And then we have Sure, in-ears, wireless systems, and uh, Dante patching. That's what the switch down here is, is a Dante switch. And so we run Dante for our tracks. We run Dante for our keys rig sometimes. Um, Dante to get audio from front of house to our studio. Dante also, if you come up here, to our live mix 
which is our in-ears set up for our band. Oh, so yeah. our band has physical, controllable in-ears systems on stage, and we use live mix to control that. So I think we have yeah, five of them on stage. And does Dante and pa does it do power over Ethernet? Or is this actually its own, by the time it gets here, Dante goes in the back of the live mix uh, kind of distributor here, whatever you call it, right? And then, yes. and, then so, and it sends its own kind of protocol probably. Right, so it. what we're sending, well the reason there's Ethernet coming out of here is because uh -huh. maybe you would go direct to the control units on stage, but yeah, yeah. we're running them into the patching. Yep. The patching on stage goes to a control yep. interface. So yeah, the Dante is going into the back of this unit, and then we choose what sources from Dante are going to be channels on our live mix system. Yep. And then from here, we send it out to somewhere on stage. So here we are on the back of the same rack here. So here's the back of the mix rack. That's where all the preamps are, getting audio in there. So this is a snake splitter, splitter snake, something like that. Uh, we used to run our live stream mix from the video room. We had an X32 in there and we'd run broadcast off of it. So this would split between what's coming in from the stage and going to our console and what's going to the X32. Oh, wow. So right now this isn't being used, but we have it here in case we ever need it for yeah. to use it. Um, but down here, I think one of the cool things is you'll see that it's all kind of color coded. Um, the black ones are on top. The second row is this, this white group of cables and then down. And part of that is we do one-to-one -one routing on our stage. So if you plug into a wall unit on stage and it says one, it's actually gonna be one on our console so that it's not confusing. Mm. So back here, it's the first eight channels on the top are eight channels on a wall panel out on stage. And so you go on stage and it said, oh, there's an open spot on channel seven. I'm gonna plug in there. You come back here, it says channel seven's in channel seven so you know it's good to go. And then you can go to front of house and just pull in channel seven and it's playing the audio from whatever you just plugged in. So this is a ANF kit, aluminum. Um, I don't know, actually know how long we've had it. It was before I got here. But it works really great for what we do. It's really gushy CCM sound. Gushy. Gushy, that's, yeah, that's a great. Yeah, gushy. It's like good gush. <laughs> this is a Franklin aluminum snare with a patina finish. This is my personal one, but the church also has an aluminum one. But they're really good. They give you good definition in your tone and a good smack still. For the cymbals, we're using pretty much all heartbeat. This is a jazz thin crash and this is a heartbeat epic special edition. These are raw hi-hats. Um, for the mics, we have MD421s. For the toms, a Telefunken on the snare top, a SM57 on the snare bottom, a Beta 91 on the inside and an AKG kick out. So it's all pretty traditional church drum miking. Oh, and then we have this Istanbul clap stack. It's pretty cool. Um, we just put in this MD mic today, or a talkback mic. Oh yeah, to walk us through that set. Yeah, so it comes out of our MD channel, um, but this is uh, just a talkback mic for the drummer with the uh, opto gate, so it's not picking up all of the drum bleed all the time. It only opens up when you put something over it to talk. You can see the red light. I think this is actually a cool area because we actually have our mics in here. So this is where the worship team hangs out, production team will hang out sometimes. Yeah. Over here, we put, we put pictures of everyone who's singing or speaking oh, for, very the, clever. for each event. Yeah, yeah. Um, part of it is we want to make sure everyone feels special. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Like, I mean, we want them to feel like, hey, we care about you. As a production team, we care about you. And so we put a picture for each person so they know where they're gonna pick up their mic from. And it's labeled one, two, three, four, just in case. Mm. And then they can come down here, they grab their in-ear pack, it charges in here, and they grab their mic, it also charges in here. And I honestly, I love this mirror because uh, we can come over here and make sure our collars are popped the right way. And yeah, make sure we got no nothing in our teeth. Yep. Good idea. Hi, guys. Dylan's not here today because Southwest Airlines, and I'll leave it th at that. So just me flying solo. <laughs> camera guy and hence, hence he's out of focus half the time <laughs> there we go you can manually focus too there's a, a no a, the, the auto works i just gotta like click on your face sometimes but i'm pretty pretty happy with it oh, oh there is auto white balance so if you guys notice some interesting color temperatures like it looked really warm a second ago now it looks oh, it looks the way it's supposed to according to the room just that's why all right this is our keys rig 
We have Nord Stage here. We have a controller because most of our musicians are using an Ableton or Main Stage sort of setup at this point. Um, our MD is typically our, our EG or our key flare, so we have a rig that we can kind of turn either way depending on who's playing. So we'll play tracks out of here, control the tracks from here, tracks go Dante through the Ethernet to front of house. And then we have some, usually it's cleaned up on Sundays, but we have some just interfaces to get all of the data in and out of these points. And uh, a key Largo down here. If you haven't seen Key Largo, it's pretty no. cool because it's an audio interface for keyboard. It's also, it has multiple inputs and you can um, change the levels of those inputs. Oh, wow. So for example, we have keyboard running into, the Nord running into here, mm -hmm. but we also have Ableton running into here. Oh, cool. And so Nord could be a backup in case Ableton fails. Mm -hmm. We just turn up the level of the Nord and then all of a sudden we got sound coming out of the Nord. Oh, cool. So that's a cool interface. Yeah. And then this, contraption that everything is sitting on is the same as our drums. So it's like a drum enclosure, just a little bit smaller without the top on it. And it hides all of our cables because that looks pretty terrible in there. Oh, I do like that. Wow. Which uh, drum enclosure company is that that makes Man, it? Man, the reason I said drum enclosure and not the companies because I didn't know. Okay. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't know. Okay. I, I could okay. find that out. Maybe someone in the comments will Maybe someone in the comments figure will. out what it is. But like the, at the whole way, you can just keep hiding cables through there. Yeah, that's a, good, that's a good idea. And then it goes all the way back to that side where it runs out into our walls. Yep, I love it. And then we have this ambient pedal, the mm. atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So we could change what type of sound you want. Yeah. And then change the key. what key you're in. That is and turn cool. it on and off. That is very, that's a cool, this is a pad generator. It's a pad basically. generator. Nice. Without having to do it through your keyboard or... Main stage. This is a Moog. It's a, and instead of an ambient generator, it's a bass generator. Mm-hmm. Yep. I love that. Do they use it a lot? We do. Nice. We'll use it um, a lot of times in transitions between songs. Mm. And then we'll also use it in some of our more like serious songs instead of, you know, it's not really for fast songs. It just gives like a nice low end, mm -hmm. solid, continuous. So yeah, we'll use that and the bass player stands here and then they'll play it and their bass will mm -hmm. jump back and forth between the two. When you're playing the broadcast mix earlier, I really liked the sound of the audience mics. So what setup are you running now for capturing the room? So we have two on stage pencil condensers. This is Audio-Technica AT4041. And because our crowd is close to the stage, this is decent. In a larger room, I would go with a shotgun condenser that's longer to mm -hmm. get further out in there. Mm -hmm. um, and then probably um, some sort of large diaphragm condenser around there. Um, but because of our room setup, these work really well. And then occasionally we'll have, we do have people that stand in the front and worship, like at our church. And so um, this picks up kind of like a, a little bit wider instead of a super narrow focused signal that you would get with a, um, a shotgun condenser. Mm -hmm. And so it's good for like the crowd here. But then also, if you point the camera into the air, we have essentially choir mics. They're just hanging condensers that are getting the crowd that's in the middle of the room. Yeah. And so... You, How many of those do you have? We have two. One okay. there and then one on the other side. Yep. And then the other stage mic. So four mics total. Yeah. Nice. And one trick with these is you typically don't want to point them directly at your crowd. Because if you do that, you're probably going to pick up one person, mm -hmm. whoever it's facing. You actually want to put it up in the air above the crowd. Because then what it's doing is everyone in the crowd is singing up mm -hmm. and all of their voices are together up here. And so this is picking up that cloud of voices and it's getting you a more open ambient sound instead of one specific voice showing up in your live stream mix. So this is our Red Komodo setup, camera setup. We have a Savvy Series 2 pull and you can see it keeps the cables clean because they're all going Inside there, we got a power cable in there, we have an SDI cable in there, actually multiple power cables, Ethernet cable. Instead of them just dangling everywhere, they're confined nicely inside that pole. And then when we replaced our tripods, I just reused the fluid head that we had on the old tripods. And then we bought basically the, the gear to hold the camera. So we had to get a plate to go on the bottom of the Komodo because the Komodo is just it's, you get to choose 
how you want your setup to be. It's not like another manufacturer where it's kind of all in one and you bring you get, you get what they, they bring to the table and you just put it there and it works. You actually have to set it up from scratch, right? So you have to build out the poles that you need. You have to get all the, the different pieces and the parts that go here. And so it took me a while to figure out what pieces and parts we wanted to make this whole thing work. Uh, but we have the main brain of the Komodo. And then we have an adapter that goes on top of the Komodo to get to Ethernet so that we can control the Komodo over our iPad. And then we have a Canon 25 to 250 lens. And under that, we have poles that hold that up just because that's so much weight. We don't want to break the mounting point here. And then I actually had to add weights on the front because the Komodo and lens are so light, our handles and screen on the back were so heavy, it kept pulling it this way. Oh, yeah. So we added weight on the front to compensate. Oh, wow. That tells you a lot about how light this setup is, which is really cool for a camera because they're usually so heavy. Yep. So then um, we have a servo motor that we can use to then control the zoom and the focus, and we have the controls here for that. So we've got zoom in and out, focus, and a 10-inch lily put monitor, 4K. Is that the, are these the Canon zoom and focus demands? Yes, these are Canon, yep. um, just because of the Canon lens. And there was no way to power the servo engine off of the Komodo. So we're actually powering it off of a small rig battery. Okay. <laughs> so it goes D-tap to whatever end the, the Canon lens needs. And so that's why I have multiple power cables coming up is because I'm powering this battery too. Got it. To get this whole setup working. Okay, so I'm sitting on these swivel chairs. I like how you bolted them into the floor because- <laughs> well, You want people to fall over? People <laughs> would fall over. I mean, you guys have the nice like steps here, but man, I'm glad I totally would have just beefed it, fallen over. Okay, so we've got two of these setups here. This camera, is it just the lens is the difference here? Is yeah, there no, anything else? Right, the only difference there is that's the 17 to 120 lens. Okay. And reason is because that one was a little cheaper than this other one, mm -hmm. and I didn't need to zoom in as far on both. Okay. Because that camera, we, we do the head-to-toe shot, yep. and so I didn't need to zoom in as far, so I could get a cheaper lens. Yep, so Where, here I am. Oh yeah, that's nice and smooth. Okay, <laughs> the other thing is, talk about price tag. Like, what does a, one of these camera setups Cost, like this one? Uh, this whole setup with everything included, not just the camera and lens, was probably 45, 50,000. Mm -hmm. um, and there are ways you could save money, like you could use a photo lens instead of a professional video lens. Yeah. But you're not going to have the servo engine, you're going to have to use like the Tilta or small rig uh, controls that they make for them, which isn't a perfect solution. It could work. We just wanted, I want my volunteers to walk in and know things are gonna work correctly. Yep. And that they're gonna work well and um, that don't take a whole lot of effort to actually make work well either. Dude, it's so simple and intuitive. Like you could train someone on this so quickly, helping them like learn, okay, you know, here's how you frame stuff, here's how you pull focus with the focus demand. Like that is nice. We, we actually, I don't know if the video will, video will probably be out before this. You guys can check out we deployed a similar setup at about maybe a fifth of the cost <laughs> for using the Blackmagic Studio 6K Pro for the camera. And then another Canon servo lens that's nice is a 70 to 200. Yeah. You just don't, you can't go as wide. So it's like, that, that's the downside. What I like about these lenses, the 25 to 250, is you can get a nice wide shot of the room um, and just more more framing options. Yeah, this also has a wider aperture than that. I think that, oh, yeah. that one's like a it's four. four. Yep. And this goes down to two something. Yep, so you get brighter lens. Yeah. Yep. And we, that means we can have a more out of focus background and things like that, which yep. we're trying to go for that cinematic look, which was important. Totally. So it's like, okay, it, it's a trade off, right? It's like, okay, do you want the $30,000 lens with those features or are you willing to, to, to kind of deal with the downsides of the $5,000 lens, right? right? It's such right. a huge thing. But I think it's, man, it looks so good, especially when you're using it in combination with like a nice cinema camera like that, the color, the sharpness. And then, oh, the uh, monitor setup, what, what is that? Yeah, so this is a Lilliput 4K, 12G SDI monitor. And so we actually go out of the camera into the monitor first, and then the monitor loops out and goes to our video switcher. 
Nice. And on the monitor itself, um, you can see like the red lines. We have focus peaking. Mm -hmm. um, that way, the, something, if something is really out of focus, it's not going to have red lines. And if something is more in focus, it's going to have more red lines. It helps the operator know like what's truly in focus. That's nice. So if I'm here, start to zoom in, you can see that the drums are going in and out of focus just because of the materials they're made of. It shines better. Um, it helps like if someone's walking on stage and they have glasses, you can really see it on their glasses, which is mm -hmm. nice for keeping someone in focus. Mm -hmm. How quickly can you train someone on this camera? Um, five minutes before service. Yeah, I know, <laughs> we, right? I, I love that if we can train people for longer than that, I, it's awesome. But honestly, it doesn't take much work. We just put them up here. We say, here's zoom. Here's focus. You push it, push it forward to focus towards the LED while you pull back to focus towards the front of the stage. Mm -hmm. And um, we tell them that some of the shots we want, and some of that's learned over time, but it really isn't hard to just jump up here and use it right away. All right, walk us through your wireless handheld rigs with the Komodo. Cool. We have two of them currently, and usually they just leave the batteries on and plug them in, so simple as that. So this is our Komodo rig. It's so small. I mean, I mean, this is so small. We used to have a C300, and it was way bigger, way heavier, and I could not let students run them. And my big, one of my big things was I wanted to make sure that our high schoolers who are 12, 13, 120 pounds could walk in and actually operate our cameras. And so a majority of our production team is high schoolers. And um, we have even someone who just graduated high school. She's 19 and she's so small. She runs around on stage with one of these things and does a great job. But we have a battery converter that this small rig battery attaches to. And then we have a Blackmagic 4K 5-inch screen. Had to be 4K to get 4K out to our video switcher. Mm. The handle on the side here, uh, that same Teradek. This is the transmitter side of it. It only has, uh, oh, actually it has HDMI inputs and SDI inputs, so you can use either if your camera body has you know, HDMI. The Komodo only has one SDI out, no HDMI outs. So the way that we actually have it set up is it'll go SDI out into the transmitter first, and then loops out of the transmitter into our screen at the top here. Mm. Yep. And with the Komodo, you technically don't have to have a screen that has a screen built in, and this isn't <laughs> that much bigger than it. Mm. Um, but the way that we like to operate, I don't want to stare down at a screen the whole time, like that would hurt my neck. Um, but also, we basically just leave data here for the camera operators to control, like exposure and things. And then here they just see visually what they're, they're focusing on. Yep. So they can look there and they can change settings. Makes it easy. Nice. Generally you want three points of contact when you're running camera, especially with a lighter rig like this, for stability. So we'll tell the operators to hold it against them, one hand on the lens for focusing and zooming, and one hand on the, ha the handle. That, that way it's stable and you don't get a ton of shaking. Now we have a few lens options. Our camera operators can choose what lens they want to use. So right now this is a 24 to 70 Sigma, which is, it gets pretty wide and it gets pretty zoomed in. So it's a good stage camera lens. Um, it's also a decent crowd lens, although it doesn't get, I feel like it doesn't, the zoom isn't enough to really do the crowd well if you're in the back of the room and want to shoot through the hands or something like that. But it does have optical stabilization built in, which is really nice for the operators so that if they are a little shaky, it kind of takes some of those shakes out of there. That's one of the lenses. This is a Canon, this is a really light lens. It's a Canon 24 to 105, so this zooms further, which is perfect for the whole room. You could be on stage, you could be off stage. It's a great range, and it's super light. But the aperture is not as wide, so if you want the blurred out look, you're not going to get that with this. Um, not as much, at least, as the 1.8 or 1.4 or whatever this one is. I think it's 1.4. Um, I like giving this one to someone who's in high school because it is so light uh, but the glass for me i would if i'm choosing between the two for like picture quality i would choose that one for the glass so those are two options and then we also have a sigma 50 to 100. Mm. and so this is a 1.8 lens this is beautiful super sharp great color great image but it's the heaviest lens so it just depends who's operating and if they can hold this one 
Um, and I wouldn't use this on stage because it doesn't get wide enough to get good shots of instrumentalists or vocalists when you're on stage with them. This is really more of like, I'm gonna be in the back of the room shooting through hands to the stage, that sort of lens. So our operators will come in here on Sunday morning or whenever service is, they will grab their camera, they'll unplug it, they'll get it ready. We have two larger chargers if they were gonna be on camera for a long time. Um, we'll also use it on like a static shot in the back of the room if we're gonna do something temporarily because it'll just last longer. Um, so usually it's the, the 100 or 99 uh, small rig battery. And then um, they'll come in, they'll turn it on. They'll turn on the transmitter, the screen, and then the last thing they'll do is plug in the SDI cable because with 12G equipment or 4K equipment, um, you can burn out an SDI port on any camera that's, that's 4K if you put it in the wrong order. Not every time, but it could happen. Wow. And so it's the opposite of Philo. Philo is first in, last out. Um, for cameras, it's LIFO. It's last in, first out. Hmm. So you, you put in this after you turn everything on, or you take it out before you turn everything off. And that's how you save your camera and its port whenever it needing replaced. In the drum kit, we also have another wireless system for camera, which we're using Teradek 4K, 6 Six bolt, six K bolts, is it what they're called? I think. I think something like that. Six bolts. Nice. And then down here, we actually this is our only non-red camera in use, and we have a Canon C uh, R five C, and so that's got a a eighteen to thirty five sigma lens on it. Super sharp, one of the best looks in our whole setup, and so it's running SDI then into a wall panel, and that's a great for drums. We created a studio space where we thought it would be um, good for us for live streaming, but also for tracking audio when we do albums. So we have an album coming out in a few months. And we tracked audio in here for overdubs. That's what a lot of this is for. This isn't actually used for our live stream. It's just used if we want to record something in here. The live stream is really just the software. Because those are just like nice analog preamps and Yeah, preamps, compressors. compressors. Yep. And um, so a few months ago, we just did overdubs for acoustic, electric, and vocals for an album that we recorded. And... Uh, What's your uh, typical like signal chain here? If you're going to plug in an acoustic, is it... Like, how does it work? Yeah, so this would be where you're plugging in if you're wanting to use these mic pre's. Yep. Or... The, this pre, um, and then these are compressors, and so it goes kind of down the chain of what you're using, um, except that you can actually patch in here. You can use, there's like little cables you oh, can cool. use to patch, yep. and so you say, okay, I'm coming in from this preamp, and I want to go to this uh, compressor, the 2A compressor, and then it sends it to it. Nice. Um, and then we go out from there into Pro Tools. So we go back out of the compressor down here into Pro Tools, whatever channel we want to use. I feel like I'm not easily impressed with live stream mixes, but what I heard from this rig was uh, very nice. <laughs> I was very impressed. Thank you. So walk us through your guys' approach to how you're doing a broadcast mix. So um, just first quickly, the hardware obviously um, we have a physical Avid panel here, that it's called the S1, and you can use this to control the faders on the software. So it makes it feel a little bit more approachable, like at front of house, where if you're used to using physical faders, you can do that. Um, or you can obviously use your mouse and turn up stuff too. And I tend to do that because I can quickly see if my face, just where I want, what I want it to do. Where here it's like, uh, I have to look down names and things. Um, but that's kind of the hardware behind it. We use the Pro Tools audio interface here for um, just getting Dante into the software. That's kind of how uh, Pro Tools works, is you, you have the hardware to process the sound, um, and in order to use Dante, you have to have the Avid hardware, as far as I'm aware. Yeah. And then we have uh, comms coming in, this physical comms, which we're not using right now, but if we wanted to, the person up here could use if they want to. And 
this grace controller is where everything is plugged into from the outside of Pro Tools. So coming out of Pro Tools, we plug all audio into here to go to our speakers. And then we control it physically here. So on this controller, I can turn up the volume. I can talk to front of house. So right now I'm talking to front of house. And they'd hear me on that MD speaker there. Um, I can mute what I'm listening to, or I can change my source. So if I wanted to listen to just Safari on the web, I'd choose that. Matrix is Pro Tools. This Apollo is this audio interface. So if I have something plugged in there, like an art computer, I could mm -hmm. listen to that through that interface. So it's a cool little control device to select things. And then we can actually select between our two speakers here. So we have the Focals, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, and that's just the main speaker we use to listen to everything on. Um, it gives you a, the general sound of the mix. And then the Aventones, which is like a terrible speaker. And so the intention behind that is like you're kind of listening through like a TV or a phone or whatever. Um, so you can switch to that, see if something sounds like it's sticking out too much in the mix. Maybe acoustic guitar because it's a high end sound or vocal. So you pull it down, then switch back to that. Just make sure everything sounds good. So it's good to kind of have a reproduction of the sound that you want. Um, you know, people at home are not typically listening on good speakers. And so you want to hear what it sounds like on bad speakers too when you're mixing. So we have lots of inputs coming in. Every input that's at front of house is coming into Pro Tools. We even have click track, MD mics, things coming in here. We're just not sending them out to our live stream. And part of that is um, when you do recording, you really want to record every input coming in because you never know if you're going to miss something. And so it's good to have every track that's coming to front house also coming to your studio setup. So on the left side, we have all of our media related thing, playback items like Resi inputs, pro, pro presenters video input here, um, talk back, a front of house, a click track. And then we have drums going from left to right. You got your kicks, your snares, toms, overheads, our SPD. And then we have instruments that aren't drums, like bass, piano, electrics, acoustics. Then we have our vocals. And you can see we have a lot of plugins on our vocals. <laughs> That's where the magic happens, <laughs> folks. Uh, yeah. Wowzers. Very nice. The SL channel is definitely my favorite. Yep. And I think it's a, a go-to for many. But it's, it's a difficult one to learn if you don't know compression and EQ and stuff right away. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily a good one to start with, but... When you, get, when you get used to compression and how compression works, when you get used to EQs without having to see visually EQ happening, this is a good one to jump to. Uh, you mean you actually have to use your ears? Ears. Wow. Yeah. No, this is sound. <laughs> All right, we got effects here, band verb, um, room verb, long verb, short delay, long delay. And some of those are for instruments, some of those are for vocals, some are for, for, band, for drums. Our crowd mics, those are the ones we talked about that are hanging. Uh, and the ones that are on stage, so crowd one is uh, the ones that are hanging in the auditorium. We have a note down here just so we know that. And then crowd two is the two mics that are on stage. They're stereo setups, so there's two channels overall here. And then on the right side we have our buses, which include like all the drums. Um, the drums compressed, um, our bass, EG, e piano, pads, acoustic, MCs. MCs is like host mic, speaking mic, pastoral mics, anything like that. Uh, vocals, audience mics again, and an overall bus. All of our media, our overall band. We broke it out a lot, so yeah. we can control it how we want to. And then all of our outputs. So these are like what are we actually sending out from Pro, Pro, uh, Pro Tools. So this is the main mix that we can then send to our live stream. Uh, we also send an audio signal specifically to our video room so that whoever's switching video in there can hear what we want them to hear. So they want to have click tracks, so we send a specific feed to the video room that has our mix plus click track. Oh, nice. And then the monitor output, which goes to these guys through this. And then a print is just a recording of their mix during the service so that we can listen back to how they mixed it. But then we can also go back and we can mix the stems again if we're like giving feedback. So after service, we might say, hey, the drum sounded a little bit too loud or something. We can listen to it together here in the print, see what it sounded like. Then we can go back and actually like remix it and see, kind of give evaluate what it should have sounded like, just so that someone can improve for the future. So that's a little bit of our layout of how we have 
everything set up. But I, I really think like the magic isn't necessarily just in the plugins for a specific channel. So well, I know we have a lot of plugins on our vocal channels, um, and uh, those are important. But everything adds up. So you have plugins on your vocal channels. We also have plugins on our vocal bus, and then we have plugins on our master output. And so all of those kind of combine together to create your mastered sound. And in live sound, we're basically mastering live. Um, in recorded sound, you usually master after the fact. And so you're, you're EQing and you're doing your compression for your channels, and you might export a song. But your song's not done until you then go through and master it. And that's adding even more compression, more EQ, subtle changes here or there on top of that song overall, not on the individual channels. And so in the live setup, we're doing that in our buses and we're doing it on our output. So we're basically mastering live, which creates the overall sound that we're creating here. Well, that wraps up this episode of Worship Tech Tour. Thank you so much, Cody, for taking us on this tour. Thank you also for holding the camera right now. Check out churchfront.com for a ton of free resources for your worship ministry. And also don't forget to download the Churchfront Toolkit where you can access our list of recommended gear and software for your worship ministry. Thanks for watching, hit the like, subscribe, and I'll see you next time.